Welcome. I'm so pleased to see so many people here this evening. My name is Stephanie Engelstein. I'm the director of the Life Sciences and Society program. Um, and I'm thrilled to see so many people come out for the opening lecture um, and keynote address of the eighth annual Life Sciences and Society Symposium, Food Sense, which is also a keynote event for the 2012 Nutrition and Exercise Physiology Research Week. As many of you know, the Life Sciences and Society program explores the sciences in their social contexts. The LSSP is interested in promoting two kinds of dialogues that don't always happen without a little bit of encouragement. On the one hand, we want to foster conversations between people who do different kinds of research, research in different fields. On the other hand, we also want to foster communication between people whose life centers here at the university and people whose lives are not focused on this space. Um, we work on both of these kinds of uh, dialogues throughout the year. But every year, this symposium is our opportunity to bring those two kinds of conversations together. And we do want you to see tonight and the rest of the weekend, if you'll be with us for the rest of the weekend, as a conversation. Our speaker tonight, Brian Wansink, who we are so pleased to welcome to the University of Missouri and to the City of Columbia, has graciously agreed to answer questions after the talk. So please stick around for that. Um, uh, throughout the weekend, there will be opportunities to engage each of our speakers um, in question and answer and in uh, conversation. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers this year. Tomorrow, we'll hear from Shirley Courier, a biochemist and the mad scientist on Food Network's Good Eats, who is also a best-selling James Beard award-winning cookbook writer. We'll also hear from Paul Breslin, who works at a chemical sensory science center, and we'll talk about anticipation. Jonathan Justice, who has turned dining into an art for all the senses at his restaurant, and William Miller, who engages in cultural studies of all kinds, but here we'll discuss the communal aspects of eating. Sunday continues with Todd Kleiman, who has turned the history of winemaking into an adventure story um, in his book, The Wild Vine, and who will discuss food cultures, and Hildegard Heyman, who will tell us why wine drinking is like a symphony. Um, panels will include not only these speakers, but also local chefs and restaurateurs, Daniel Pliska and Lee Lockhart. This kind of event requires incredible generosity and time and financial support from so many people and groups. And um, first of all, I'd like to ask my co-chair, Sarah Gable, to stand up. <laughs> she, she's been fantastic to work with. And will the other members of the planning committee uh, stand up? You've, uh, yay. So they've all been wonderful and they've made this event happen. Mizzou Advantage and the provost of the University of Missouri, who I'll be able to welcome to the podium in just a minute, has provided support for us to bring uh, this event, event to you year after year. And we're also grateful to the Department of Nutrition and Exercise Physiology, the schools and colleges of medicine, of, medicine, of journalism, of agriculture, food and natural resources, arts and science, law, human environmental sciences, the Office of Research. You can see how we bring lots of different uh, groups together to talk by asking them for money. Um, and, uh, and also many of you who have actually provided uh, individual donations, so thank you very much for that. I want to give a particular thanks to the Life Sciences Center, which is where I live, professionally speaking, and recently it seems in reality. Um, and uh, I want to thank um, LSC Director uh, Jack Schultz, who's a fantastic source of advice, um, as well as the Life Sciences staff who make this event run um, and are really fantastic to work with. Um, we also have partners who have planned events around the same topic as the symposium. Some of those are still ongoing, so please check out the exhibits at Ellis Library and at the PS Gallery. I don't want to delay proceedings uh, here too much, but I want to give you a very early sneak preview of next year's topic. Um, and, you know, put it all in your, in your mental calendar for next March. Um, if, you, if this sounds interesting to you, to you and you're interested in participating in planning it, please get in touch with me at lssp at missouri.edu. Um, and we do have an idea for next year's symposium. It's a little bit vague, which is why we need your help. But after that, it's, it's up to you guys. You know, if you think of something that you would like to see represented in this kind of a symposium, and you are interested in helping uh, getting involved, please let me know. You know, let us know about topics, um, and we, uh, we're happy to work on those. So um, in the last few decades, We've noticed uh, people at the, at the LSSP, uh, people who are friends of mine um, at the university, have noticed that there's been a lot of interest in culture, which 
I'm defining in the broadest sense as human communal living, the fact that people live together in communities. Um, and that, that interest in culture uh, has come from the sciences, the social sciences, and the humanities. There are different methods for studying why people live together and how they live together. But the people who study those from those different perspectives don't often talk to each other. And so we thought it would be great to bring them together to, um, to see what they can learn from each other and what we can learn from them. Um, so as you can see, the topic's still very vague. So come help us uh, shape it. Now I'd like to introduce the provost of the University of Missouri to the stage, Dr. Brian Foster, who has done so much to make this university more interconnected, both internally and externally, so that we have the opportunity to welcome scholars and writers to campus and learn from each other. Well, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, good evening, and welcome to this uh, keynote speech tonight, which I'm very much looking forward to. Uh, there's nothing more exciting for me as a provost than to watch the process of knowledge creation, to sort of watch what's being developed and, and uh, uh, advanced and communicated to students, to the community, uh, to among scholars in various fields. Uh, this is really what the university is about. Uh, this symposium is about, I've got to tell you, this next two sentences I could never have had the imagination to develop. So this is stolen from Stephanie, okay? Uh, this symposium is about sense. Um, not only about the sense of taste, but also about the way we make sense of one part of our world, namely the food we eat. Uh, accumulating knowledge, of course, is always about making sense of our world. Wow. Uh, anyway. So the more we learn and the better we understand how to learn as a society and as individuals, uh, the better we, be we become at navigating our lives and making them meaningful. And this process is really what research and education is about. A little bit of background about MU's focus on food. Over the past few years, the University of Missouri uh, has developed a program which we call Mizzou Advantage, which, was, uh, which builds on our real special, even unique strengths here at Mizzou so that we can develop uh, uh, subject matter areas um, that are, are really world preeminent. Uh, one of those areas at Mizzou is food for the future, as we call it. Very broad, very interdisciplinary. It's about production of food, about food safety, about food security, about nutrition, about distribution of food, about environmental issues, about the culture of food, very, very broad and rich uh, commitment that we have to the study of food. Uh, and very much, very much built on interdisciplinary collaboration. The Life Sciences and Society program is a striking example of the kind of interdisciplinary collaboration, interdisciplinary thinking that the Mizzou Advantage is all about. And we're really delighted to see the alignment of this symposium with the Mizzou Advantage uh, Food for the Future um, uh, area. Um, in their annual symposium, but also in their research and teaching across the year, throughout the year, the program is really dedicated to exploring important questions from multidisciplinary perspectives. The wide appeal of this approach is clear from the variety of people represented in this audience tonight. Uh, we know from the registration information, many of you work in the health professions, uh, some in teaching, in research, in communicating on nutrition and other health issues, but you also are food writers, um, artists, historians, biologists, sociologists, social workers. I mean, the, it's stunning. Farmers, journalists, students, teachers, professors. It's a stunning variety. And I think that's really the most stimulating kind of thing you can have going on at the university, bringing people together that have different approaches, different knowledge bases, ask different kinds of questions. That's what really sparks the interesting work that we can do. Uh, it's not, not often that you get such a diverse group and, and that has the opportunity to come together around a single issue, uh, but it's really important and revitalizing when we do it. So I want to applaud the ongoing efforts of the Life Sciences and Society program to bring together not only scholars from the humanities and sciences and medicine and food and natural resources and journalism and technology, but also to foster conversations among members of the university and the community. This weekend, we're going to hear and talk a lot about what we like to eat and why we like to eat it. And tonight, we're also going to hear some practical advice about how not to eat, which is, of course, a tough thing not to do. 
Um, so anyway, now let me introduce Jack Schultz, who's director of the Life Sciences Center, the home of the Life Sciences and Society program, uh, as well as a remarkable level of influential and collaborative uh, interdisciplinary research across the life sciences. So Jack. Okay, discipline. What do you think? A great university is made up of disciplines or subject areas with excellent participants, teachers, researchers, communicators. Uh, this university is no exception to that. But this university is an exception to the rule that that's all you have. As you've heard from the previous two speakers, uh, the campus, and particularly the Bond Life Sciences Center, really thinks that the, uh, the sum can be greater, the whole can be greater than the sum of the parts. The Bond Life Sciences Center stands for that. Uh, and we've begun to realize, and you can see it here in the group assembled, that collaboration among disciplines includes disciplines not found on campus, not found in the sciences, uh, maybe only found far away. And we are absolutely delighted to have the Life Sciences and Society program in the center uh, and delighted with the way it brings people together. If you're interested in making programs like this happen, please stop by. We're really in interested in uh, making new connections. Uh, we're really interested, for example, in reaching out to understand how the arts and the sciences uh, intersect. So discipline may be an important word, but it's not the only word. It's just part of a team effort that a great, makes a university great. Now, it's my pleasure to uh, bring on somebody who's going to introduce the, tonight's speaker. You thought it was almost over, didn't you? Um, but this is one of the most undisciplined guys I know. So, or, No, I mean, he's disciplinary, but anyway. Um, He's the McGuinn Chair of Entrepreneurial Leadership in Agriculture and Applied Economics. He's in Kaffner, the College of Agriculture, Food, and Nat uh, Nat Natural Resources. Sorry, He uh, studies consumption. I've consumed with him, and he's pretty good at it. Uh, <clears throat> competition and entrepreneurship. Uh, and he's a friend and colleague of this evening's speaker. So I'm going to bring on Randy Restren Westgren, excuse me, Randy, Randy Westgren, to introduce the speaker. Thank you, Jack. It is indeed a pleasure for me to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Brian Wansink. Brian is the Dyson Professor of Marketing at Cornell University, where he's been since 2005, following a decade of work at the University of Illinois. Brian is the founding director of the Cornell Food and Brand Lab and has worked tirelessly over the last few years in building a new center for the behavioral economics for children's nutrition. And he told me today he has been lunchbox diving in elementary schools all over the East for the last two years. And I think he's going to tell us some of the stories from that tonight. As the provost intimated, the mission of a Research One University is about knowledge creation and knowledge dissemination. If that's the case, then Brian Wansink's pattern of work is truly an engine for knowledge advancement. In the last 10 years, he's published more than 100 journal articles in more than 40 different journals. He's published three books and has reached out to the American public and professionals in a myriad of ways. I'll talk more about that in a second. But Brian is not just an ivory tower academic. In 2007, he was asked by the White House to go to Washington and act as executive director of the Center for Nutrition Policy and Promotion. He spent two years there helping to work on more advanced plans for increasing the nutritional attainment of people across the United States. He's also served uh, as a consultant to the United States Army. Uh, they had a peculiar problem that combat soldiers in Afghanistan and Iraq were expending 7,000 plus calories a day, but only able to consume about a third of their needs, particularly when faced with those nasty meals ready to eat uh, that they were given. And Brian was asked to come in and actually spent time at Fort Leonard Wood trying to develop ways to get past the calorie limitation that was forcing the, uh, the troops to be at less than ideal strength. But 
But what does he do? What does Brian do? Well, he's liable to follow you around in the grocery store and see what you buy. And he might be followed in turn by the BBC or 2020 or any number of news magazines watching him watch you. He may come into your house and see what's in the cupboard way in the back that you bought in, in that fantastic buy five, get three free sale. Uh, there may also be a graduate student going along behind with some calipers to measure your body fat, just in case uh, there's a consequence of your choices. He's liable to show up in your dining hall or a restaurant. Uh, one of the uh, experiments that he ran some years ago was the never-ending bowl of soup at a local restaurant that actually had tubes coming in through the bottom of the table that kept the bowls of clam chowder from ever being emptied. Uh, the idea, of course, was to figure out when people would finally stop eating, and the answer is they don't. Uh, Brian actually uh, won the Ig Nobel Award in 2007 for that research, which shows that people are paying attention from all different parts of society. I've seen him deliver candy into the staff offices across the university and variously place them with covers and without covers in glass jars and in clear jars and put them 10 feet away from your desk or three feet away from your desk. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of experiments. And over the course of time since he got his doctorate at Stanford University in 2000 in consumer behavior and marketing, he has completed almost countless number of experiments, which left me and many other colleagues wondering, what's it all about? What what does it add up to? There's just so much going on in his, his past. And as I was getting ready to, to mention this tonight, I thought of a passage from Ralph Waldo Emerson in his essay on self-reliance. And it goes like this. There will be an agreement in whatever variety of actions, so they be each honest and natural in their hour. For of one will... The actions will be harmonious, however unlike they seem. These varieties are lost sight of at a little distance, at a little height of thought. One tendency unites them all. The voyage of the best ship is a zigzag line of a hundred tacks. See the line from a sufficient distance and it straightens itself out to the average tendency. Your genuine action will explain itself and will explain your other genuine actions. A couple of years ago, Brian wrote a book accessible to all of us called Mindless Eating, which was the revelation to me of the voyage of his zigzag ship and where it was going. And tonight we are honored and have the pleasure of listening to Brian as he shows where that ship has gone from mindless eating to mindlessly eating better. Please welcome Brian Wansink. Thank you very much, Mr. Dean, distinguished professors, my good friend, Randy Westgren. You know, I think kind of a lesson there is that if you want a great introduction, you have one of your best friends give it to you for you. <laughs> Thanks very much. We're going to talk a little bit about mindless eating to mindless eating better, but this has momentum. It has a direction. So I think things will apply to your life in a number of different ways, to all of our lives in a number of different ways. But where I really want to take this is toward kids. Another way we could title this would be Psyching Kids Out, the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. Now, <clears throat> How many people have seen this diagram? It's, it's sort of a map of fat, OK? What it does is it's color coding that shows us how fat we are state by state, you know, as if we don't need anything you know, to lift us up. In 1991, you can see there's a lot of light blue states, which means we're not very fat. 1996, there's a lot of dark blue states, which means we're getting fatter. 
You can see in 2003, we've actually had to add new colors, right? <laughs> Being an overachieving nation we are, we've got gold, we've got red, and this is kind of red. You can see that. But what I wanted to look at is what would happen is we, if we were to project this out to the year 2025, okay? And I've got a lot of these space age economists who work with me, and I thought, let's just see if we can come up with a trend to see where we're going to be in another uh, few years. You guys ready for this? <laughs> okay, I totally made that up, okay? <laughs> totally made that up. But what I'm going to talk about today is three things. I'm going to, I'm going to present some studies that address, do we really know what we like, and do we really know what we do in reading? I'm going to apply some of that to this thing called the Smarter Lunchroom Movement, and I'm going to end with three questions that I think plague our times. Burning questions such as, <laughs> where should you sit at a Chinese buffet? <laughs> How can you become a better cook in less than five minutes? And what should you put on your home counter? Okay. Well, the lab that Randy was talking about is the Food and Brand Lab. And our mission is to discover what we hope will be transforming solutions to help people eat better. Not very many of them are transforming, but you know, if you don't aim high, you come up with something else. But I'll give you an idea. We, we found in general in the past is that if your immediate environment causes you to overeat, one thing to do is to say, oh, great, now that I know it, it shan't happen. <laughs> no! If you find that big plates cause you to serve about 22% more than a slightly smaller plate, well, get a small plate, okay? Use a 10-inch plate. Don't say, must not over serve, okay? If we find that short white glasses, like a 10-inch tumbler, 10-ounce tumbler, cause you to pour more juice or pop or gin than a tall, skinny <laughs> highball glass, well, don't say, great, now that I know it, I won't over pour. No, just get rid of your short white glasses. White uh, big bowls cause you to serve more, use smaller bowls. I mean, <clears throat> some of the things we've done when we found these things, we've gone to all these different buffets and said, look, people are eating a whole lot more when you give them a big plate than a smaller plate. So cut the size of the plate down. People will still think they've had a full plate of food while eating a whole lot less. Oh, uh, yeah, and uh, Mr. TGI Fridays and all you sort of casual dining chains, you know, your bartender's going to overpour the liquor in a glass it's short by about 30% compared if it's a tall, skinny glass. So if you don't want your patrons over drinking and you don't want to pay for a lot more liquor than you would ice and soda water, use tall, skinny glasses. But I mean, these things are all around us. I mean, we found that <clears throat> when you walk into your cupboard or your refrigerator or the cereal, the breakfast cereal you have in your home, the very first thing you see, the very first cereal, the very first thing you see in your pantry, very first thing in your refrigerator, you're three times more likely to take than the fifth thing you see. So why not just rearrange those different environments so that the first thing you see is going to be the healthiest cereal and not, you know, Captain Crunch with crunch berries, which I now have as the fifth cereal, not the first. <laughs> but what we're going to look like is the answer to mindless eating Mindful eating? No, it absolutely isn't. Because for about 1% of the population, it can work to like cut the raisin in half and taste the raisin and do that. <laughs> but for most of us, you know, you're, you're, you're going home, you're just beat from a day of working, you've got a to-do list of 30 things, you still want to finish that night, the kids are screaming, the microwave's buzzing, the phone's ringing off the hook, your beeper's going off. To expect yourself to cut the reason in half and go, mm. <laughs> it's just not going to happen. So for most of it, that'd be great if it worked, but for most of us, the better answer to mindless eating is simply changing our environment so it mindlessly works for us rather than against us. So that causes us to mindlessly eat a little bit less rather than overeat. What we're going to do is we're going to look at this in the context of school lunches in some cases. So I got this phone call from, from the Los Angeles Times about three weeks ago. 
And I don't know, have any of you followed what went on in L.A. with the school cafeterias a while back? A couple people? Yeah, so they did this really bold, bodacious move of changing all the food in their lunchrooms. Okay, they got rid of all the chocolate milk. They got rid of the cookies. They got rid of hamburgers and french fries. Um, I, I think uh, kale and tofu were the two things that were left. Um, and what they ended up doing then was thinking this would help kids eat better. And at that point, about 28% of the kids in L.A., Eight school lunches. So I get this call from this, this woman from the LA Times, the health reporter, and she goes, you know, the data just came in about this study. You know what happened in the last semester? I'm like, you know, people stopped eating school lunch? She goes, how did you know? <laughs> <laughs> and she says, and she really, she says, I guess it's all over for school lunches because nothing will help kids eat better. Well, we're going to look at a couple of things, and here's a couple of starting points. If we can figure out why people do what they do, we might be able to nudge them one direction or the other to kind of mm, psych them into eating a little bit better. We're going to look at why we know what, do we know what we like, do we know what we do? Now, <clears throat> you've heard the French expression, there's no accounting for taste. Well, sort of the assumption there is that, hey, I know what I like, I know what I don't like. It's black and white. And in reality, this is tremendously a gray zone because what happens is that we taste what we expect. If you expect something that's going to be really, really, really bad, or you ever really excited and surprised that it tastes incredible good? No. And similarly, if you think something's going to taste really, really great, it's probably going to taste a whole lot better than if you said, eh, I don't know what it's going to taste like. And so we did this thing a while back. And if you look at this guy, this is a, a guy who's in charge of all the food services at the University of Illinois. I mean, a massive campus like this, 33 dining halls, and he was doing something ingenious at the time, kind of a stealth health approach to getting people to eat healthier. He was taking one of the restaurants, actually a couple of them, and transforming the entire menu to be healthy without telling anybody. You know, we call it stealth health. The, the whole idea would be to, for instance, to, you know, like to chocolate cake, to put applesauce in it instead of you know, equal amounts of uh, oil and chocolate, or uh, using baking things, stuff like that. But what was the problem with doing this? Nobody was eating there. And he said, hey, what can we do to get people to eat? And so we tried a bunch of cool things. But one thing that's really basic was working on the idea that we taste what we expect. We set up this study where for two weeks, we would offer a food um, unlabeled, you know, like a seafood filet. Then two weeks, we might take it off the menu, and then the other two weeks, we'd put it on. But we'd give it a kind of a descriptive name, like succulent Italian seafood filet. Okay. Now, really, it's just basically a dried out fish stick. <laughs> <laughs> like probably the same one they had three weeks ago, OK? <laughs> but it has a cool name. What do you think happened by just giving it that little bit of suggestion? Well, sales went up on average for all these things, 28%, okay? And people would say, oh my God, this is just unbelievable. You know, they'd rate it better. They'd rate the restaurant as more trendy and up to date. They even rated the chef as having had more years of culinary training, okay? And this guy had been like, you know, fired from Arby's a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> but people are going, oh, look gold and blue. Eh, eh. But you know, the thing is, it got so ridiculous, it didn't matter how stupid the name was, it worked. So, for instance, instead of naming something chalk, instead of naming something just chocolate cake, if we called it Belgian Black Forest double chocolate cake, it didn't even matter that the Black Forest isn't in Belgium. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, oh, Antwerp, hmm, and, <laughs> and we find that this happens over and over again, and we want to look at how far can you push something like this. So for instance, if you start off a meal with an appetizer that you think is going to be bad, is it going to poison the rest of the meal? Um, or if you start off with a bad glass of wine, are you just going to say the rest of the meal, regardless of how great it is, is terrible? So we did some, we have this research restaurant, which is Oh, it's so cool. People come into it, they pay about 25 bucks in Thursday's prefix meals. Um, what they don't know is that they're being, they think it's just to evaluate food at the end of the night. 
What they don't know is that it's a, it's a place where we do studies every Thursday. And, and one Thursday we did something where we we're going to look at whether if you bias the first part of a meal, does it just mess up the rest of the night for people? So what we did, <laughs> what we did was we ended up buying cases upon cases of $2 wine called Charles Shaw wine. <laughs> yeah, yeah, two buck chuck. Yeah, that's what they go. <laughs> and what we did is we soaked off all the labels and we replaced the labels that, saying that it's a Cabernet that is either from California you know, a place known for wine, or we place it with a label from North Dakota, <laughs> a place maybe less famous for its wine. <laughs> it was the 50th state to commercially produce wine, the very last state. What happened, you know, people came in, and you know, and this, is, you know this is at the University of Illinois, and it was cold winter night. People came in and sat down, and what we did is we had waiters and waitresses They'd go up to people as they sat down at a foretop and said, uh, hey, thanks for keeping the reservation tonight. You know, to give you, show you some thanks, we've got a complimentary bottle of Cabernet. It's new from California. And they pour everybody glass and set it right in the middle of the table, okay? okay? For the other half of the people, the waiters or waitresses would come and do the exact same thing, except they'd say, thank you for keeping your reservation tonight. We've got a complimentary bottle of wine for you. It's new from North Dakota. <laughs> <laughs> set it right in the middle of your pour it, set it right in the middle of the table, so it's, that North Dakota's like glaring at you. <laughs> now, what do you suppose happened? Well, sort of what kind of the predictable thing would be if you were from California, if you had what you thought was California wine, Again, it's the exact same wine, just a different label. <clears throat> you rated the wine as better. You rated the meals better. You stayed as long as you could until you got kicked out for the next seating. And when we asked if you wanted to make reservations to come back, a lot of you did. Okay. Now, people from North Dakota didn't, didn't have such a magical evening. Okay. <laughs> when asked, when asked. <clears throat> You thought of the wine, you go, ugh, Dad, what are you thinking of dinner? Ugh, it's mediocre. You finished about 10 minutes faster than most people did. And when you left and somebody asked you if you wanted to make reservations to come back, most of you didn't. And one guy even said, oh, no, I, 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 I'm really busy for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> so so these, these perceptions tremendously bias us. And you know, from a distance, we can look and we can say, yeah, yeah, that would influence somebody else, but uh, not me, not me. Because we all think we're kind of smarter than the average bear when it comes to sort of the things that move us one direction or the other. Let me give you an example of something that um, had some pretty smart people that had been told about this ahead of time. Rainforest smoothie. It's unbelievable how suggestible our taste is. I'm Brian Wansink. Hi. To demonstrate that, Wansink tricked some of our own staff, seven of 2020's college interns. First, he added some chocolate sauce to vanilla yogurt. Then he told the students... We're going to be doing a little strawberry yogurt taste test. Okay. On the table, he had some strawberry yogurt containers. So if you could put your blindfolds on, what The students put on blindfolds, tasted the yogurt, and then Wansink asked them to compare the strawberry tastes. I think they both tasted really strong with strawberry. All the students were certain they were eating strawberry yogurt. This one had a much stronger strawberry taste to it. No, it just tasted more like strawberry. With this woman, Wansink tried something different. We're going to be tasting a couple different kinds of yogurts today. Okay. He didn't tell her what flavor it was, so when he asked her to rate the strawberry taste... Honestly, okay. I didn't notice it's strawberry. Okay, good. And yet, by the time I interviewed the group, she too had accepted the idea that she'd eaten strawberry. When you, like, follow up with the question, like, which one is more strawberry, I was like, I had to choose one. They all believed it was strawberry. Actually, none of them was strawberry. <laughs> it was vanilla yogurt with chocolate sauce. <laughs> Stop. That can't be. What do you mean it can't be? Well, I, I thought I tasted strawberry. I guess also, when I opened my eyes, the two yogurts in front had a strawberry on the box. I think you're joshing us right now. I do. Because I, I feel like they, there was definitely a taste of strawberry. No, it was vanilla yogurt with chocolate sauce. But you thought it was strawberry. What? It tasted like strawberry. 
I swear it did. <laughs> the moral to these stories, says Juan Sink, is that we are much less taste sensitive than we think we are. We don't want to really believe that we are duped or fooled by something as simple as the... Now, the incredible thing about that <clears throat> is that it's not just naming things. I mean, if you end up having somebody comes up for dinner and you end up saying something like, hey, here's some chicken, they'll go, oh, okay. If you do anything and say, hey, here's some, uh, some of this new chicken, new, new chicken recipe that I'm trying for the first time, all of a sudden it gets elevated from, yeah, whatever, put it down, to at least a little bit better, okay? But it's also not just the names behind things, it's associations you end up having with them, whether you're eating off of a paper plate or china. We've given people SpaghettiOs off of paper plates or off a of nice china, and their rating of SpaghettiOs goes up dramatically when they're eating off a of nice china. <laughs> SpaghettiOs! <laughs> it's whether there's lighting, it's anything that influences the perception that something's gonna taste good makes it happen, okay? Now, if you think of schools, what do schools do? If you think back, what do schools do that actually work in the reverse? Well, they certainly never name things. They might go, What's to, what do you have today? Gorn. Corn chicken. Huh? Huh? <laughs> but it also goes beyond that. We find that when we visit school lunchrooms, it doesn't matter whether it's elementary, high school, or middle school, about 25% of school lunchrooms have the exact same thing that greets you when you walk in the lunchroom. It's at the very front of the line, and what's it called? The trash. <laughs> it's like, wow, man, that is setting up my taste expectations. I mean, you never see that at McDonald's, or you never walk into TGI Fridays and they have you know, like the, um, some, some sort of the dumpster sitting there in front of the door. So there's probably a lot of things that we could do, even in school lunchrooms, to actually help make kids think healthy food's better than it actually is, and essentially nudge them toward the healthier stuff than from the bad stuff. Well, let's take another look at another thing, and it's do we know what we do? Now, <clears throat> think back to the last time you ate at a buffet. Mm. For most of us, it probably wasn't that long ago. But <clears throat> What do you think skinny people do at buffets that heavy people don't, okay? Whether it be a Chinese buffet, whether it be a pizza buffet, it doesn't matter. Because not everybody who eats at buffets, you know, looks like they're gonna be a contestant for the world's late greatest loser, or what's it, the largest loser campaign. No, there's a ton of skinny people who eat at these buffets. We wanna figure out what is it that they do that, that heavier people don't do. I mean, because the boneheaded answer would be, they eat less? But you know, where do they sit? Uh, you know, what do they eat with? How do they eat? How do they serve themselves? And so we did this a while back. <clears throat> we did this uh, across uh, the United States, and, or uh, in seven states. We had 12 coders, 370 diners. We had them go in and watch people and code over 70 different variables, like uh, how many times they went back, who they're sitting with, how they're facing, all sorts of bizarre stuff. And we had these secret agent tools. Like we had this thing, it's a weight mat, where you know, we put, <laughs> we put it in the entrance of, because you, know, you want to figure out who's heavy and who's not heavy, their, their body mass index. <laughs> so we put, we put these mats right in the front of the restaurant. So you know, dum -dum 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 -dum, somebody comes in, they walk on it, and beep, it shows us exactly how much they weigh. I mean, with their clothes on. Okay. <laughs> I know, this is terrible. So, and then we had these laser height things where they put out these laser things, and it, if, where it broke your hair, your head, it would tell you how tall you were. Um, we put these up next to the buffet, so you know, subtracting your shoe height. You'd have a rough idea of somebody's height. Um, I think they also blind people, if you happen to look at them. So, <laughs> so we actually didn't use that very often. We just marked the buffet so we could estimate people's heights. Um, we had clickers, we had these stopwatches that kept breaking, uh, Cracker Jack. But one of the things we found, and if you think about it, what do you think a skinny person might do differently than a heavy person? Does anybody want to venture a guess? Eat more vegetables. Eat more vegetables? Some uh, about a plate? Put less on the plate. They put less on the plate, yeah. Sit further from the buffet. Sit further from the buffet. And why don't we start with that? The first thing we found is that they make food less convenient. On average, the skinny people sat 16 feet farther from the buffet than the heavy people. Okay, 
they're three times more likely to use chopsticks. And, <clears throat> and on average, they chewed three more chews per mouthful. <laughs> One, two. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and they, they made food less visible. Like they were three times also more likely to sit away from the buffet, sit facing away from the buffet than facing the buffet. A lot of heavy people, about 73%, sat facing the food, Keep, keeping an eye on that some, you know. But there are, the other people were more likely to face either to the side or even totally away from it. Um, but they also tried, you know, I guess you could say they made food look bigger. And now that they put less on their plate, but they're three times more likely to use a smaller plate if offered at the buffet. So let's take a look. Here's a thin diner. She's sitting 16 feet farther away, three times more likely to face away from the food, more likely to sit in a booth, okay? Um, and that's kind of weird, but we, we later found out it's because it, sometimes uh, it's more comfortable for, for thin people to sit in booths than it are heavy people. Um, more likely to have a napkin in their lap, more likely to use a small plate, more likely to use chopsticks. Whereas here's this poor guy. <laughs> he's, he's, <laughs> he, you know, I, I, he's needlessly close to the buffet, I admit. <laughs> he tends to face the buffet, he sits closer, he's more likely to use a fork, more likely to sit at a table, and more likely to use a large plate. Okay. Now the thing is, here's what they do. The thing is, the amazing thing is, when we would intercept people as they left the buffet and say, hey, uh, why, do you, why do you sit where you sat? Why do you sit facing the way you did? What do you think people's response was? I yeah, I don't know. Gee, I, I, is that what I did? I, I can't even remember where I was sitting right now. That in almost every single case, these things weren't deliberate. They, they happened somehow. It was a habit. Maybe they got formed. But it was not a deliberate choice. Essentially, they were mindlessly eating in a way that may seem to be correlated with them being skinny versus less skinny. Another interesting thing I didn't mention here <clears throat> is, is the way they, they serve themselves. Okay, How do you think skinny people serve themselves at buffets? That is exactly right. They survey the whole buffet. They get up, they take a look around. Yeah. Essentially, they're looking at what they're going to cherry pick and put in their plate. And then they go get their plate. What's the heavy, average heavy person do? Well, about 77% of them beeline to the plate, picked it up, looked at the first item, and kind of, I imagine them saying to themselves, is this really terrible or will it do? <laughs> mm. Is this really terrible, or will it do? It'll do. And this continues on. So what happens is that the favorite foods that they would otherwise like, they don't even get to the first helping. And I think these are very, and when you ask people, how'd you come up with that strategy? They're like, I, I don't know. Was that what I did? And I think it, where it leads us is maybe there's a lot we can do to guide school cafeterias, to guide kids to take apples instead of cookies, and to think the apple actually tastes good, OK? And we started something called the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. And <clears throat> it started off a while back with the New York State Department of Health called us and said, and said hey, we're going to be giving these $4,000 grants to a bunch of these schools in New York State, um, like uh, Lake Saranac, uh, Plattsburgh, um, you know, places that are kind of like, they're just like a few miles from, I think, Antarctica, I think. I mean, they're, way, they're just way up there, yeah. And they said, we're going to give these $4,000 grants. And, and the goal is to get kids to take 5% more fruit, increase fruit sales by 5%. They said, how much do we need to cut the price of fruit for kids to take 5% more? And the fruit was like about 50 cents a piece, you know, banana, apple, peach, and stuff. And uh, we said, yeah, not sure cutting the price is going to do anything because they're basically getting it for free anyway because mom and dad are paying for it. And so we, we, we took a group of about eight people up there for three days and did a bunch of stuff in cafeterias. And one of the things we found is that <clears throat> in a cafeteria like this, the fruit would be in this nasty-looking chafer pan. Nasty, nasty, nasty. And it'd be down the darkest end of the line. You'd have to contort yourself to get that orange. 
move past the sneeze shield, move toward the cleaner part of the sneeze shield. <laughs> and, and it's no wonder people aren't taking it. So he said, okay, here's what we want to do. Forget changing the price. Here's two suggestions. Put it in a nicer bowl and put it in a well-lit place. Two really simple things. And <clears throat> we were working with eight schools at the time, and five schools did it. And sales went up for the year, for the next semester, not 5%, but 103%. It's off scale. So the second school, <clears throat> one school, I guess they, <laughs> they didn't really get the memo. Because, I mean, that seems pretty clear. Nice bowl, well it place. <clears throat> and so we're sitting there, and, every, and every, what happens is every month we would check in in the schools, and they'd give us a, an update, a rough count of production records. And this school missed the first update. So they, got, they came to us in the second month. And we're sitting around a conference table. And these are really, really great guys I'm, I'm blessed to work with. We're sitting around a conference table, listening to them on speakerphone to these other schools that are in different places. And this one school says, after the first five report, one school goes, oh. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, don't, I think we did it a little bit wrong. <laughs> They said, they said, we put it in a nice bowl, but then we did, we, we found a desk light that no one was using, <laughs> brought it out and turned it on the fruit. <laughs> and so these guys, the guys who I'm fortunate to work with and my team, you know, are really, really good people, but they are just, they're just like coughing up milk through their nose, they're biting their knuckles. <laughs> To not make any sound on the speakerphone, and we turn on, we put, we put it on silent. Then everybody laughs for about ten minutes, and we put, take it off silent. And, and I said, "Oh, uh, how did that work?" And the woman goes, "Sales went up 187 <laughs> percent." Like, oh, we'll change that. Will it place to a nice desk lamp? <laughs> and then two schools were too cool for school. They refused to do it because they said, it's obvious and it will never work. So their sales went up this, this much percent. But we, shortly after this happened, we got a call from this other school uh, in Corning, New York, which is, you know, you've, you have Corning wear. That's kind of where it kind of originally came from. <clears throat> and their problem was, they said, like, nobody in our junior high buys salad. Okay. And they had this little salad bar. And really, it, it, it really looked like compost, really. <laughs> <laughs> but this little salad bar. But they said, we need to know, what should we do? Should we lower the price or should we add new vegetables? You know, like those little Barbie corns, you know, things like that. <laughs> well, let's take a look at what this thing looks like. Here's what the cafeteria looks like. See the door up there in the upper right-hand corner? Kids came in there. There's an a la carte line up to the top, and there's a hot lunch line here, a couple cash registers, and this beleaguered salad bar. Just, I mean, really sad looking, sitting over there. And they're like, see, here it is. I think we need more stuff. What do you think? And we said, well, I don't know. Um, give me 40 seconds. <laughs> 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 and so, you know, we didn't change it at all, but, you know, all of a sudden you have these, you know, junior high kids are coming in, they get the thing, they're walking the cash register, they hit the salad bar, you know. They look left, they look right. Mm. They, you know, they walk around it and pay. But the second, third, fifth, seventh time that happens, you start seeing people taking salad to the point where within two weeks, Daily salad sales increased 200 to 300%. <laughs> we didn't add any Barbie corns. <laughs> we didn't price direct the price. And what it does, it led, led us to this idea that <clears throat> the bigger questions are, what are some low-cost, no-cost things that schools can do that can help kids eat better? Because clearly taking away their chocolate milk and taking away their cookies and leaving the ask roll kale and tofu doesn't seem to be working. So what can be done to bump up the good stuff kids take, maybe decrease the frequency they take the indulgent stuff, and overall get more kids to eat? Because 
what we find, especially at the junior and high school level, kids that end up eating school lunches end up eating, they tend to eat a whole lot better than kids who instead bring their lunch from home or skip lunch or order Domino's and have it delivered at the door or bring in Funyuns and Mountain Dew. <laughs> but let's, let's take a look at this. This is something um, MTV did a little bit of a uh, story on something they were doing. Let's just take a look at Professors this. at Cornell University have found that just by switching up the layout of a lunch line, you can make students eat healthier without them even knowing it. So let's see if it works. Right now, the lunch line is set up the way it normally is. So we're gonna track what the students choose with this layout. On this day, what do these teens want to eat the most? The bad stuff. They snapped up tacos, cookies, and sugary drinks, but the skim milk and the bean burrito were a tough sell. In fact, just 6% of the school got fruit and only 11% got vegetables. Based on my experience as a lunch man, these teens aren't even close to the government's goal of having half their diet be fruits and vegetables. Well, what can we do to redesign a lunchroom for less than 50 bucks? <laughs> well, I think we need a new chair, Brian. Because <laughs> the thing is, if we come up with solutions that are horrendous interventions that, cause, that need retraining and need new lunch lines and stuff like that, there's no way they're going to get any traction because schools don't have any money. But if we can come up with things that cost less than 50 bucks, there might be a chance. And so one of the things we did was we wrote an op-ed piece for, um, this is for the New York Times, where we took a lot of the findings that we had found in restaurants and said, what if school lunchrooms were to do this? So for instance, um, one of the things we find is that if you have three vegetables in a row, whatever vegetable is first in line, a person is 11% more likely to take than if it's third in line, okay? So if you have okra, kale, and um, black-eyed peas, whatever's first, it doesn't matter what it is, people are 11% more likely to take. Well, so, so why not put the healthiest thing as the first thing in line? What we end up finding is that <clears throat> simply putting butcher paper or paper over an ice cream um, uh, freezer ends up decreasing how much ice cream kids take, but it increases how much fruit they end up taking. Primarily because they're walking by and they're not going, look, ice cream. They're walking right by and saying, I'm still hungry, and they grab a piece of fruit. We found a lot of things like this, and <clears throat> one of the things that we were very pleased that, see, we could probably do a whole lot better. We have hearty vegetable soup. <laughs> Clam, <laughs> Clam chowder, hamburger, large hot dog, or the famous grill chicken roll. <laughs> well, <clears throat> there's a lot of changes that can be made. And one of the things we did is we said, what are some things that, that would be really easy for lunchroom to do to increase how many kids take a fruit? We came up with three things that work. We found worked in lab, ABC. We did the same thing for what can help people take more vegetables, what can help them take more white milk, what can help them take a healthy entree versus less healthy, healthy entree. And one of the things we've done is worked with the USDA to get this stuff put in as suggested guidelines for any school that wants to be a healthier US school. But then we're also doing outreach to try to get schools across the nation to make these boneheaded, easy, overnight changes. Um, the average school that does a total makeover spends less than 32 bucks. Well, let's take a look at um, what we did with uh, Boynton Middle, Middle School. Let's, we'll just go back to that. The masterminds behind the cafeteria redesign are Cornell University professors David Just and Brian Wansick. I wanted to know how they're going to basically trick teens into eating right. So what are we doing here? The first thing we're going to do is we're going to take a bunch of the milk, put it in front, so if a person's thirsty, at least they have the option of picking something up. At least they have to reach over the white milk if they want to pick up right. a uh, flavored sugared beverage. Step two. They took the pizza, which was the first thing in the lunch line, and moved it towards the back. And the veggies and the healthy bean burrito moved right to the front. Step three, they renamed the healthy food. We find that changing something as small as calling 
These mixed vegetables, California blend with a big bed, bean burritos, increased sales by about 27%. Step four, they move the fruit from a plastic tub into a pretty fruit bowl. And finally, they took the cookies and put them just out of reach. They're gonna have to ask one of the food service workers to help pick it up. We think that's just enough of a barrier to keep some percentage of kids from saying, eh, whatever, I'll have an orange. The professors rolled up their sleeves, made their changes, and now it's lunchtime. Oh, there she's getting her tray. She grabbed a sandwich. She's oh getting God. an Arizona iced tea, I think. An orange juice. Ah, and she got the cookie. So, Samantha, this time you didn't get the cookie and you got a piece of fruit instead. Why'd you get the fruit this time? Why, why do you think? I don't know. <laughs> well, this was an unbelievable success. Fruit increased by 102% simply by putting it in a nice bowl. The sweet drinks were also harder to get to, and Jane, Marcy, Richie, and Levante fell right into our trap. Last time they grabbed Gatorade, Snapple, and Arizona iced tea, but this time... Well, the water was just in front, so I just grabbed it. Sales of sugary drinks plunged by 17%, while purchases of easy-to-reach milk soared 46%. Whatever was easiest to reach, that was good enough for them, and that was enough to get them to change. Another hit, the Big Bad Bean Burrito, sold out for the first time ever. The professors say, on average, students' plates this time around contained about 18% fewer calories, and they made healthier choices. You know, the, the crazy thing about that is that as stupid as those things are, you think junior high kids would be smart enough to see through those things? No! Not only that, these things, these things persist. They continue for the rest of the semester. But remember when we were talking about giving descriptive names and how the stupidest names even seem to cause people to buy stuff. A big bad bean burrito. <laughs> you know, there's nothing about that even sounds attractive. It sales went all the way up. And the vegetables, <clears throat> um, the, the kids, we had kids name these things, and the kid says, we'll, we'll call them the California blend. I'm like, you can't call them California blend. You don't know they're from California. And they take the can and go, Calamonte. California company. I'm like, <laughs> well, <clears throat> we've started this thing called the Smarter Lunchroom Movement. The idea is to get schools to adopt, make at least two little changes to their lunchroom. Two changes that cost nothing, but they'll make them a little bit more heroic next time some parent attacks them and says, you're poisoning our children. And our goal by the end of 2011 was to have <clears throat> 3,000 schools, and we, we had just over 3,000 schools adopted. By the end of 2012, it's to have 10,000 schools. We have 9,000 now. And by the end of 2015, it's to have 30,000 schools do these makeovers. Now, one of the things we are also fortunate to be associated with are, is with the land-grant university. When I was at the University of Illinois and now with Cornell, the land-grant schools, just like Missouri. And, and there's something about being a researcher at a place that has a mandate to try to improve the world and life around them that is really inspiring. And I'm very grateful to be at the school, and I, I'm, I've been very proud to be a part of land-grant schools, and, and I, I hope you see the pride and the impact that, that Missouri has on the rest of the state and even beyond the state. Well, <clears throat> we're going from three to 3,000 schools. There's some ways we're doing it using extension service. But in conclusion, I want to go back to you. Where should you sit at a Chinese buffet? <laughs> Far away. And which direction should you face? <laughs> face away. That's right. How can you become a better cook in five minutes? You're having that special someone over for dinner. You kind of want to impress her with your cooking. What can you do that's going to make you a better cook even though you're terrible? <laughs> Start with wine and don't call it North Dakota wine. Fair enough. <laughs> Give the food a name. Come up with some description, some sensory description of it. You end up kind of turning the lights down a little bit. Maybe, uh, maybe turn the computer screen off and put on a candle. Anything that raises the expectations that, that food's going to be great <clears throat> will make it great. Uh, if you have been, tell them that you've been 
preparing it all day. <laughs> oh, well. What should you put on your home counter? Yeah, it, a fancy bowl of fruit, any bowl of fruit. But the crazy thing is, it's got to be really close, I think within about two feet of where you walk. Any farther out, it's just out of sort of the, the grabbable range. And you know what happens? So we've, we've done this with some kind of some, <clears throat> in a fun way with a little panel that we have. And you know what happens to the amount of fruit that people eat on the first day when they put a fruit bowl in a visible part of the counter right next to the door? Nothing. <laughs> In fact, nothing happens the first week, and for most people, nothing happens the second week. But what happens is at the beginning of the third week, that's when people, they've been accustomed to seeing this, and that's where you find the percentage of people who take fruit goes up dramatically. And that fruit bowl starts emptying after about the second or third week. And it's the same way with school lunchrooms. <clears throat> when we make these changes, God, the first two weeks, I mean, you could have, you could make any change, and kids look at it, and they have no idea what to do. And they have to kind of get used to seeing it for about two weeks before somebody sort of cautiously goes over and <laughs> does anything. <clears throat> but these are easy, mindless changes to help you eat better or to help you enjoy food more or to help that special someone think your uh, SpaghettiOs are pretty amazing. <laughs> well, I thank you for the honor of being here, and I'm, I'm pleased that we have about 10 minutes for questions. Thank you. I love the comment about the don't serve North Dakota wine. <laughs> and any questions about this or about, about anything related to food that you might be? There are, there are gonna, microphones in the aisle here. If you want to come up from the microphone, you're probably able to hear your question. Or you've got your hands up. I, I'll just repeat your question. You can just... um, how did chopstick proficiency impact... Oh, what a, what a great question. He's talking about the change of faces. How did chopstick proficiency influence things? Well, what we had to do for this for it to be unbiased, because if you look at the average Asian person, they've got real low BMI to begin with, and they're very good with chopsticks, which most of us are injuring ourselves, or there's flesh wounds, or, you know, the person over there has an eye patch on. <laughs> <laughs> and so one of the things we excluded from all the analysis was, was anybody who was, was Asian. Yeah, that, that's a, yeah, because, because <laughs> it says, <laughs> Because at some point, watching the guy try to pick up a piece of rice, his hands cramped, and <laughs> he's losing consciousness. You know, it wouldn't work. <laughs> Great question. Yes, sir. Yes, are your subjects in your restaurant studies aware that they're being studied? Outstanding question. He said, are, are the subjects who come to the restaurant, are they aware something's being studied? They are aware something's being studied but not what is actually being studied, okay? So this is set up as a, as a restaurant where people learn how to cook. Uh, you know, these are, these are University of Illinois students where they learn how to cook, learn how to wait tables, and they get a little certificate for it because, you know, the great research schools can't give you, a, you know, a three credits for cooking, you know? So we were doing this sort of off on, <clears throat> on the side. And so when people come, with, they're still paying 25 bucks, but what they believe they're kind of supporting are kids learning how to cook, and kids learning how to, you know, um, wait tables. And so they're given this little description that says, here, we're going to be asking you questions about the food and about the service, and you might be being, you'll be observed, and you might be asked some other questions. But they, they code it as, it's a rate the menu sort of uh, duty they have, or rate the server duty. And so it ends up being very effective because, you know, this, uh, the uh, IRB form they end up signing is very inclusive, but most of them walk away just thinking it's about the food and it's about the service. Excellent question. And you know, for any of you who are researchers <clears throat> and, you, and you struggle with IRB, the, the Institutional Review Board I mean, is an incredible group. I mean, and I know Sarah's on the one here, I'm on the one at Cornell. We got it, it seems like we meet all the time. <laughs> but we, we want studies to go through, we want them to be successful for both the <laughs> people who are doing it and the people who are, who are subjects. And all you have to do is work with them and go back two or three times, and they'll figure out a way to make it happen for you. Yeah, we've been waiting back there. I'm curious to know if you looked at any trends related to, like, mid-semester exams, 
What a great, yeah, what a great question. You know, we have something, <clears throat> we have something that's under review right now, which is, is really neat. In which we took all, all of the um, a la carte um, kind of food sales in all the Cornell dining, not dining halls, but in the um, you know, places where we buy a la carte stuff, like the snack places. And one of the things we find <clears throat> is things go like this, that healthy foods are highest at the beginning, the sales of healthy foods are highest at the beginning of both semesters. It doesn't matter whether it's fall or winter. They start really high, they start dropping as the semester goes on. The unhealthy food starts going up as the semester goes on. So these things end up crossing. And, and what ends up happening is, and then what we've had to eliminate from the analysis is what happens in the last week of finals, because things go haywire. <laughs> I mean, there isn't one apple being sold the week of finals. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it's great that that's, you know, uh, that, that article's under review and, and uh, we're hoping it's going to get accepted. Great question. Yeah, yes, please. Well, I'm going to use the mic since I'm so close to it. Okay, does that help? Thank you. Um, I am a kale eater. <laughs> 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 well, the reason is that my dad used to bring a bushel basket of kale home from the farmer's market. My mom cleaned it. I ate it, and, and I like it. This last Saturday, I went to the farmer's market here in Columbia, and I saw, I was so excited, I saw four different kinds of kale. Do you think this is going to be a coming thing, or am I the only one that's going to like the kale? <laughs> Yeah, and I just, you know, the thing about kale is we just think it's a great punchline for a lot of jokes, so, <laughs> kale. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think that there's a growing market for that. I know I've got friends who make kale chips and stuff like that. Um, um, but oftentimes, when I've had kale in some different places, this isn't a trend, but kale sort of like um, when, I've been, when I eat collard greens and stuff. I eat those too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but it's, is it just basically a vehicle for like butter and bacon? Oh, no. <laughs> Not for you, I don't know. <laughs> no, it's California cake. <laughs> 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 Very good. <laughs> to, to kind of follow up on her comment, though, um, I'm old enough to remember when Coors beer was a big deal. And it was a big deal because you couldn't get it most of the country. And the place where people drank it was on a ski slope. And that kind of emotional connection of food to experience and whatever is, I think, what drives a lot of food choices. And I'm wondering if your research has gotten onto that question. Oh, it's very powerful. And actually, it's funny, funny you bring that up. When I was, I grew up in Iowa on the Sioux City, and, and when I was there, the drinking age was 18. And the big thing is when somebody would bring back some Coors from Colorado, you know, and you know, basically when you're 18, you taste any beer, and you kind of go back, but you taste and go, oh, God, that is the good stuff. <laughs> incredible, incredible. Blah. But there, there are a lot of things. <clears throat> we, we find that a lot of comfort foods really get instilled, not necessarily when people are young, but just simply with a repetition of favorable experiences. And a lot of people, if you think of your favorite comfort foods, 60% <clears throat> of your favorite comfort foods, for 60% of you, your favorite comfort food would be something really indulgent, like a you know, chocolate-covered sundae or tortilla chips or something like that. <clears throat> but for about 40% of you, your favorite comfort food would be something that's relatively healthy. I mean, it might be steak or it might be soup or it might be some sort of uh, side vegetable, but it'd be something pretty healthy. But one of the things we, we found that was really interesting and <clears throat> is that this often breaks out by men and women, that, that women often really prefer convenient foods, which often, as comfort foods, which often aren't that healthy. And guys tend to prefer these meal-related foods. And when we talk to guys, we'd say, why is it that steak's a comfort food for you? Or why is this uh, hamburger helper a comfort food? They go, oh, yeah, when I eat that, man, I feel like a king. You know, I really... I imagine, you know, being served this stuff and just sitting there and eating and eating and eating. We go to women and we say, hey, you know, uh, 
do you like steak? Do you like Hamburg Helper? And things like that. And they go, yeah, but I, mean, I don't see it as a comfort food. Because when I think of it, I don't think of feeling like a king. I think of me or my mom having to make it and clean up after it. <laughs> so for the vast majority of women, their favorite comfort foods ended up being convenient foods, which often ended up being kind of trashy foods. <clears throat> but I think that there's ways, there's ways that you can sort of, let's call it engineer comfort food preferences. Um, one of the things we find is people say, well, I don't know if you don't like it when you're a kid, you're never going to like it. And that is totally wrong. We could take a right food. Let's say kale, for instance. <clears throat> and if there's some way that we could pair it with a positive experience that we have, like let's say every, every night um, we called home and said, oh, man, you know, something really great happened today. If our spouse ended up making something in kale, and that happened again and again and again, we would start very subconsciously to start pairing it with this positive event. And maybe not in a year, or maybe in two years, but eventually we'd start seeing kale as, as more comforting than as bitter, which we might see as now. Yeah. It's a tremendous, tremendous question. Yes, yes, right there. And I have to add, with kale, the target audience... Again? <laughs> Excellent. I mean, that's, that is... So, so, in saying this has to be the perspective, is there is a flavor that we can add to kale. Kale is delicious. Yeah. Because it's a good thing. Yeah. And it's a good thing. Because realistically, if we look at all of this audience, we're last because we prefer to start talking. So, you look at a child, they're going to want flavor to it, and we can do that without adding core value to it. That's a great so, point. Yeah, I think that's a great point. There's a lot of things that when we actually prepare them for <clears throat> our kids at home or in the school system, you know, we don't really work that hard at preparing them and adding anything that really will make them that tasty. But I like your point that there's pretty small things we can do that can maybe take it from being here to being here. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, back there. Any research on getting picky adults to eat better? <laughs> Interesting. <clears throat> Any research on getting picky adults to eat better? Um, <laughs> um, you know, there's, you know, not not any that I can think of just right off the spot, because I'm trying to work kale into the answer. <laughs> so let me let me tell you a funny thing about kids. So. <clears throat> I don't know how many of you take your kids to a McDonald's or Burger King or stuff like that, you know, but kids like to go to those places often. And for a lot of uh, adults, that's, that's really, that's a reality. You know, you burn out, you know, they let them go, where do you want to go to eat? McDonald's, 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 McDonald's. And <clears throat> if a kid goes there, can they eat healthy? I, I mean, I think they can eat healthy. You know, if they end up getting a little cheeseburger and a milk and the, and the apple fries, which are, you know, apples that are cut up like slices, yeah, they can eat really darn healthy, and they get that little toy which makes the meal fun and stuff. <clears throat> but what do you do to get a kid to want to eat apple slices instead of french fries? Because most normal kids don't want apple slices instead of french fries. Well, we did this stupid, dumb study that just came out in a tremendous journal that <clears throat> What we did is we took all these kids who we had at a summer camp. These were like six to eight-year-old kids. And <clears throat> on average, about 5% of kids will order apple fries, apple slices, and about 95% will prefer french fries if you give them a choice. And one of the things we did was just before, about five minutes before, we drove up to fast food place to get them apple fries or french fries. We'd say, let me ask you a question. And we had these little flashcards that had <clears throat> three really cool people on or three really bad people on. Like, it would have Batman or it'd have the Penguin. It would have um, Hannah Montana or it'd have this, this kind of this, this woman at a beach that shouldn't have 
been wearing that bikini on the beach. <laughs> and we'd say, hey, what would Batman eat? Apple fries or French fries? And they would say some random thing. Oh, apple fries or French fries. We'd go, okay, what would uh, the Joker eat? Apple fries or French fries? Okay, what would Hannah Montana eat? And it didn't matter how they answered the stupid question. We pulled up to fast food company, and they ordered, 45% of them ended up ordering apple fries or apple slices. Now, the thing is, if you do this 20 minutes ahead of the time you get there, it drops from 45% of the kids down to about 25% of the kids. But there's something about causing a person to pause and say, what would person X do? That was enough, you know, at least for six to eight-year-olds, to have them go, hmm. Huh. <laughs> and make a little bit of a smarter choice. Great question. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not disputing the funny onions and the Mountain Dew coming yeah. in with the high school, but a true homemade lunch. And I guess, is that really true that that's not as nutritious? And what if, what if are people, not necessarily your research, yeah. but what are people doing to make home lunches? And it would even be interesting to hear from somebody here who's in the Columbia Public Schools. Um, what, what do they see? I think my kids have really healthy home lunches, and I know they eat them because... They bring the leftovers home. Okay. They, of, but, I mean, what, you know, they, they bring the leftovers home because we compost. Yep, so I, got I it. see what's left. Are, so. they, uh, are they under 10 years old? <laughs> no, but I've made home lunches. For, and and we're, not, we're not health enough. We're really no, not no, no, no. I, I mean, my kids, well, my boy eats cheese wheels. Yeah. So, you know. No, no, no. The reason, the reason I asked if they're under 10 years old is we find with, with elementary kids, <clears throat> when they bring them in, some people bring in unbelievable lunches. You know, parents pack unbelievable lunches. Uh, some parents pack less believable lunches. <clears throat> but by and large, you know, this is the time when the you know, kids are bringing their lunch. You know, parents still think they're cute, and they haven't given up on them. <laughs> so, but we do most of our work in June. We do a lot of stuff in elementary schools, but a lot of the content analysis. And as Dr. Westman was talking about, a lot of us wading through the waste of lunches happens at the junior high and high school level. And that's where kids just they have a few more degrees of freedom. They have a little bit more cash. And that's where um, you know, we, we find that what they bring, and I shouldn't say from home, but from what they bring from outside can be different. Yeah, yeah. But I think, I, like I, I, I'd say, and this is just a rough estimate, and that about one out of four lunches we see a high school kid bring is really pretty healthy healthier than what we might, we might otherwise get. Um, so there's a lot more work that can be done on that. And, and yeah. kudos to you. Here's the entrees at our, I mean, our school here has decent size items, but the, uh, the entrees are pretty gruesome, really. Mm. Um, I mean, not, not, you know, mozzarella cheese, whatever they call them. <laughs> they were like fried mozzarella. Yeah, they need that recipe for the big bad bean burrito. <laughs> Yes, yes. Yeah. So in the context of learned behaviors, is there, so what's the word on, so teaching children how to, so exposing them to say fast food restaurants at younger ages so that they're able to responsibly deal with that temptation, so to speak, as they get older, and rather than totally shielding them from it, so when they are more freedom, like you're saying, in the adolescent years, just going crazy because they don't know how yeah. to. You know, I think that's a really, really great point. And that's one of the reasons with school lunches, you know, I'm like, well, let's don't get rid of all the, the, the nice things, the indulgent things. Let's just set them up so that the playing field is so unbelievably tilted toward the healthier stuff that you go in that direction. Because what's going to happen the day that kid graduates from high school and goes to the all-you-can-eat college bars, or college, I mean college cafeterias around here? Man, it is just, it's just like pull the ripcord on the raft, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so we wanted to do some, some healthy things, but yeah, very, very good. Yes. We're going to take just one more question, and thanks so much for your time, Brian. Hi. 
Um, very interesting presentation. Uh, I feel like a lot of it focused on kind of manipulating the display. So children were kind of chose the healthier foods um, just by, by chance or because it seemed more appealing. But do you do any research on um, educating kids on healthy foods so they, they learn the habits and they understand why they're eating these foods and maybe make um, real lifestyle changes? You know, that's an outstanding question. Um, <clears throat> I am the president for the Society for Nutrition Education. And the first thing I did when I took over as president about a year ago was we changed the name to Nutrition Education and Behavior. Because it's not that I don't believe in education, but I believe that if we had 100 kids here and we said, what is healthier, the apple or the cookie? Most of them would know that. And I'm a big believer in education in some ways, but it's some, in some cases, it's almost better just to learn a tool than it is to learn a lot of details. The details work a lot for some people, but not for people who are really disinterested. So it's great. And if I had my way, <clears throat> part of the national education um, um, testing would be on nutrition in schools. Because I think that would be one way to really get this across. OK, thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming and being with us tonight. And uh, thanks for the wonderful questions. Let's, let's give our speaker another hand.